<laughs> um, hello. Uh, I'm not doing, I'm just going to be trying to read through the whole book now. Okay, um, let's see. Just need to check something quickly and we'll be off. Um, hey guys, sorry, I was just checking something. Uh, today I'm going to be trying to get through, um, a lot of chapters. We're on chapter 12, and I want to get to the last chapter of the book. Um, and also, um, the, uh, in the description down below, Zoe wanted me to inform you guys that there is something that... If you like voice acting or otherwise, please go check that out and go check, um, like, audition. She's trying to put together an audiobook of something she wrote as a freshman. And the deadline is, I think, March 2nd to get in. So, um, I'm not sure, but, yeah. Anyways, let's get started. Um, mm. Hold up, someone just texted us. How fun. I'm trying to do something here. Uh, okay, there you go. So, yeah, we're going to be reading for a while. <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me and definitely make comments because I do read them. <laughs> okay. Chapter 12, The Mirror of Erised. Christmas was coming. One morning in mid-December, Hogwarts woke to find itself covered in a several feet of snow. The lake froze solid and the Weasley twins were puni uh, punished for bewitching several snowballs as to the... the I'm already messing up. This is going to be a long read. Also, by the way, if you, hadn't read, if you haven't read this book before, it's kind of hilarious that Fred and George were throwing snowballs at Quirrell's that head because that's basically literally what they're doing is throwing it at Voldemort's face and smashing Voldemort's face with with snowballs so I thought that was kind of funny okay um the lake froze solid and the Weasley twins are punished for bewitching several snowballs so that they fall the quirrell around bouncing off the back of his turban they the few owls that managed to battle their way through the stormy sky to deliver mail had to be a nurse back to health by Hagrid before they could fly off again. No one could wait for the holidays to start. While the Gryffindor common room and the Great Hall had ro roaring fires, the drafty corridors had become icy and bitter. Wind rattled the windows in the classrooms. Worst of all were Professor Snape's classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in mists before them, and they kept as close as possible to their hot cauldrons. I do feel so sorry, said Draco Malfoy when potions class, for all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. He was looking at, over at Harry as he spoke. Crabbe and Goyle chuckled. Harry, who was measuring our powdered spine of lionfish, ignored them. Malfoy had been even more unpleasant than usual since the Quidditch match, disgusted that the Slytherins had lost. He had tried to get everyone laughing at how wi a wide-mouthed tree frog would replace being Harry a seeker now. Then he'd rather he realized that nobody found this funny because they were all so impressed that Harry, the way Harry had managed to stay on his bucking broomstick. So Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. It was true that Harry wasn't going back to Privet Drive for Christmas. Professor McGonagall had come around a week before, making a list of students who would be staying for the holidays, and Harry had signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. This would probably be the best Christmas he'd ever had. Ron and his brothers were staying, too, because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they left the dungeons at the end of potions, they found a large fir tree blocking the corridor ahead. Two enormous feet sticking out of the bottom and a loud puffing sound told them that Hagrid was behind it. Hi, Hagrid. Want any help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. No, I'm all right. Thanks, Ron. Would you mind moving out of the way? Came Malfoy's cold drawl from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra money, Weasley? Helping to be gamekeeper yourself when you leave Hogwarts? I suppose that hub Hagrid's must seem like a palace compared to what your family's used to. 
Ron dived at Malfoy just as Snape came up the stairs. Weasley? Ron let go of the front of Malfoy's robes. He was provoked, Professor Snape, said Hagrid, sticking his huge hairy face from behind the tree. Malfoy was insulting him, his family. But as it may, fighting, but that as it may, fighting it, fighting is against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid, says Snape silkily. Five points from Gryffindor. Weasley, and be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle pushed through roughly past the tree, scattering needles everywhere and smirking. I'll get him, said Ron, grinding his teeth at, at Malfoy's back. One of these days, I'll get him. I hate them both, said Harry. Malfoy and Snape. Come on, cheer up. It's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Tell you what, come with me and see the Great Hall. Look's a treat. So the three of them followed Hagrid and his tree off to the Great Hall, where Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick were busy with the Christmas decorations. Ah, oh, Hagrid, the last tree. Put it in the far corner, would you? The hall looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung around the walls, and no less than twelve twittering Christmas trees towering. Why did I say twittering? <sighs> no less than t twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days you got left until your holidays? Hagrid asked. Just one, said Hermione. And that reminds me, Harry, Ron, we've got half an hour before lunch. We should be in the library. Oh yeah, you're right, said Ron tearing his away, eyes away from the Professor Flitwick, who had golden bubbles s blossoming out of his wand, and that was trailing them over the branches of the trees. New tree. <coughs> um, oh yeah, you're right, said Ron, tearing his eyes away from Professor Flitwick, who had golden bubbles blossoming out of his wand, and was trailing them over the branches of the new tree. The library? said Hagrid, following them out of the hall. Just before the holidays? Being a bit keen, aren't you? Oh, we're not working, Prof Harry told him brightly. Ever since you messaged... Me 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 messaged... Message, not message. Mentioned. Nicholas Flamel, we've been trying to find out who he is. You what? Hagrid looked shocked. Listen here, I've told you, drop it. It's nothing to you. What that dog's garden? We just want to know who Mc Nicholas Flamel is, that's all, said Hermione. Unless you'd like to, us, uh, to tell us and save us the trouble, Harry added. We might have, we must have been through a hundred books already, and we can't find him anywhere. Just give us a hint. I know I'll read his name somewhere. I've no, uh, I've, I know I've read his name somewhere. I'm just saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. I'm saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. Just have to find out for ourselves then. And Ron and they left H Hagrid looking disgruntled and hurried off to the library. They had indeed been searching books from a female's name ever since Hagrid had let it slip. Because how else were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was, it was very hard to know where to begin. Not knowing what female might have done to get himself into a book. He wasn't in great m wizards of the 20th century or notable magical names of our time. He was missing, too, from the important modern magical discoveries and the study of development, developments in wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library. Tens of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she had decided to search, while Ron strode off down a row of books and started pulling off the shelves at random. Harry wandered over the to the restricted section. He had been wondering for a while if Amel wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, you need a specifically signed note from one of the teachers to look in at any of the restricted books, and he knew he'd never get one. These were the books containing powerful dark magic never taught at Hogwarts, and only read, read by older students studying advanced dark uh, defense against the dark arts. What are you looking for, boy? Nothing, said Harry. Madam Pince, the librarian, banished a feather duster at Brandished a feather duster at him. You better get out, then. Go on. Out. Wishing he'd been a bit quicker at thinking up some story, Harry left the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had already agreed that they'd better not ask Madame Pince where they could find Flamel. They were sure she'd be able to tell him, but they, they, could, they couldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. 
Harry waited outside in the corridor to see if the other two had found anything, but he wasn't very hopeful. They had been looking for two weeks, after all, but as they only had odd moments be between lessons, it wasn't surprising they'd found nothing. What they really needed was a lo nice long search without Madame Pince breathing down their necks. Five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined them, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. You will keep looking while I w I'm away, won't you? said Hermione, and send me an owl if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who Flamel is, said Ron. It'd be safe to ask them. Very safe, as they're both dentists, said Hermione. Once the holiday had started, Ron and Harry were having too good a time to think uh, much about Flamel. They had the dormitory to themselves, and the common room was far emptier than usual. So they were able to get the good armchairs by the fire. They sat by the hour, eating anything they could spare, a spear on a toasting fork, bread, English muffins, marshmallows, and plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled, which was fun to talk about, even if they, would, they wouldn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry wizard chess. There, this was uh, exactly like muggle chess, except that the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in a battle. Ron's set was very old and battered, like everything else he owned. It had once belonged to someone else's in his family, in this case, his grandfather. However, old chessmen weren't a drawback at all. Ron them, knew them so well, he never had trouble getting them to do what he wanted. Harry played with chessmen Sh Seamus Finnegan had lent him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't a very good player yet, and they kept shouting different bits of advice to him, which was confusing. Don't send me there! Can't you see his knight? Send him! We can afford to lose him! On Christmas Eve, Harry went to bed, looking forward to the next day for the food and the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. When he awoke early in the morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. Merry Christmas, said Ron sleepily, as Harry scrambled out of the bed and pulled on his bathrobe. You too, said Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. What did you expect? Turnips? said Ron, turning to his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the po top parcel. It was wrapped in thick brown paper, and scrawled across it was, To Hagrid, Harry from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid had obviously whittled it himself. Harry blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclosed your Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Petunia. Tapped on the nose, taped to the note was a 50 pence piece. That's friendly, said Harry. Ron was fascinated by the 50 pence. Weird, he said. What a shape. This is money? You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Hey, Grid and my aunt and uncle. So who sent these? I don't know. Well, did it there. I think I know who who's that one from, said Ron, turning a bit pink and pointing at a very lumpy parcel. My mom. I told her you didn't expect any presents, and oh no, he groaned. She's made you a Weasley sweater. Harry had torn open the parcel to find a thick, hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large home box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a sweater, said Ron, unwrapping his own, and mine's always maroon. That's really nice of her, said Harry, trying the fudge, which was very tasty. His next present also contained candy, a large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione. This only left one parcel. Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery gray went slithering to the floor, where it lay in a gleaming folds. Ron gasped. I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice, dropping the box of every flavored beans he'd gotten from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked the shining silvery cloth of the floor. It was strange to the touch, like wa water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, and looked at of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders and gave and Ron gave a yell. It is! Look down! Harry looked down at his feet, but they were gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him, just his head suspended in midair, his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized the letter, written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before, were the following words. 
Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give anything for the one of these, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who had sent the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open, and Fred and George Weasley bounded in. Harry stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else yet. Merry Christmas! He hey, look! Harry's got a Weasley sweater, too! Fred and George were wearing blue sweaters, one with a big yellow F on it, and the other a G. Harry is, in, is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding up Harry's sweater. She obviously makes more of an effort if you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? George demanded. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon, Ron moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a letter on yours, George, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name. But we're not stupid. We know we're called Gred and Forge. <laughs> What's all the noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disapproving. He had clearly gotten halfway through unwrapping his presents as he, he, too, carried a lumpy sweater over his arm, which Fred seized. P for prefect. Perfect. Ugh. P for perfect. G get it on. Percy, come on. We're all wearing ours. Even Harry's got one. I don't want said hit Percy thickly as the twins forced the sweater over his head, knocking his glasses excuse. And you're not sitting with the perfects today, either, said George. Christmas is a time for family. <clears throat> the frog march... The b -b 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 they frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his side by his sweater. Harry had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mounds of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of chip chipolatas? I don't know what that is. What are chipolatas? Usually I would ask dad, but he's like all the way downstairs and I kind of don't want to yell. <laughs> uh, if anyone knows what chipolatas are, would you mind telling me? Because I don't know what they are. Or search them up and tell me. Mm. Okay, um... Tureens of butter peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic f party favors were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually bought, with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper, paper hats inside. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred, and it and it didn't just bang, it went off like with a blast like a cannon, and engulfed them in all in a cloud of blue smoke. While from inside exploded a rare uh, rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up at the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointy wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet, and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming... Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed. Her top hat lopsided. Oh man, great time to get drunk at, a, at, a, at school, right? <laughs> When Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-exploded, uh, explodable, luminous balloons, a grow-your-own warts kit, and his own new wizard chest set. The white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs. Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight on the grounds. Then, cold, wet, and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a meal of turkey, turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifles, and a Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed, except sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they had stolen his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it. The invisibility cloak, and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake, and no with nothing mysterious on to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains 
of his four-poster bed. Harry leaned over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from underneath it. His father's, this had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the no head said. He had to try it now. He slipped out of the bed and wrapped the cloak around himself, looking down at his legs. He only saw moonlight and shadow. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was now open to him in this cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this. Anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him black. Black. Blah, blah, blah. Something held him back. His father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room, and climbed through the portrait hole. Who's there? squawked the fa uh, fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Huh, the fat lady is going to get so used to that by the time Harry gets out of Hogwarts that she's just going to be like, opens eyes. Oh, it's probably them again. Good night. <laughs> um, and where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing, and thought, and then it came to him. The restricted section in the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took... It, as, 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 as long as it took to find out who Fumel was. He set off, drawing the invisibility cloak tight around him as he walked. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way along the rows of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair, and even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it, the sight gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope, that separated these books from the rest of the library. He held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. Their peeling, faded gold letters spelled words and languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it, maybe not. But he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they, know, they knew someone was there that who shouldn't be. He had to start somewhere, setting the lamp down carefully on the floor. He looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting-looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty because it was heavy, and balancing it on his knee, let it fall open. A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming! Harry stepped it shut, but the shriek went on and on, one high, unbroken, ear-splitting note. He stumbled backwards and knocked over his lamp, which was out at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor. Stuffing the shrieking book back on the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Filch in the doorway. P Filch's pale, wild eyes looked straight through him, and Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arm and streaked out, up the corridor. The book shrieks still ringing in his ear. He came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suit of armor. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid much attention to where he was going. Perhaps because it was dark, he didn't re recognize where he was at all. There was a suit of armor near the kitchens, he knew, but he must be five floors above that. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone you was wandering around at night, and somebody's been in the library, restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a short shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer, and to his horror, it was Snape who replied. The restricted section? Well, that they can't be far. We'll catch them. <clears throat> Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came around the corner ahead. They could see him, of course, but... It they couldn't see him, of course, but it was the, a narrow corridor, and if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. A door stood ajar to his left. I was, it was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move it, and to his relief, he managed to get inside without them their noticing anything. They walked straight past, and Harry leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. That had been very close. That had been ve close. Very close.
It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It was like an unused classroom. The dark shapes of the desks and the chairs were piled against the walls, and there was an upturned waste bas paper basket. But propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there, something that looked as if someone ju had just put it in there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high as the ceiling, with an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved around the top. Er said stra eru oit u kafru oit on wohi. I can't say Latin, and I'm pretty sure that was Latin, so I'm sorry I butchered that. I should ask, um, I should ask Zoe. She might know. Okay. His panic fading now, there was no sound of Filch and Snape. Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look at himself, but see no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself from screaming. He whirled around. His heart was pounding far more th furiously than when the book had screamed, for he had seen not only himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people standing right behind him. But the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned back slowly to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking, and there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still there was no one there. Or were they all invisible, too? Was he, in fact, in a room full of invisible people, and this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? He looked in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind him. His reflection rose, smiling at him and waving. He reached out to touch the hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflection were so close, but he only felt air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair in her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass, bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying, smiling, but crying at the same time. A tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up in the back, just as Harry's did. Harry was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mom, he whispered. Dad? They just looked at him, smiling, and slowly, Harry looked into the faces of the other people in the mirror and saw other pairs of green eyes like his, other noses like the, his, even a little old man who looked as though he had Harry's knobbly knees. Harry was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The potter smiled and waved at Harry, and he stared hungrily back at them. His hands pressed flat against the glass, as though he was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. He was powerful. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The, the reflections did not fade, but he looked and looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses. <coughs> Sorry. Hold up. Okay. Um. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him. How long he stood there. He couldn't say, but he had to find his way back to bed. He couldn't stay here. He had to find his way back to bed. He tore his tore his eyes away from his mother's face, whispering, I'll be back, and hurried from his room. He, you could have woken me up, said Ron, crossly. You can come tonight. I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. I'd like to see your mom and dad, Ron said eagerly, and I want to see your family, all the Weasleys you'll be able to show me, your brothers, and everyone. You can... You can see them any old time, said Ron. Just come around my house this summer. Anyway, maybe it's only shows dead people. Shame not finding Flamel, though. Have some bacon or something. Why aren't you eating anything? Harry couldn't eat. He had seen his parents and would be seeing them again tonight. He had almost forgotten about Flamel. It didn't seem very important. Who cared what three-headed dog was guarding? What did it matter if Snape stole it, really? Are you all right? said Ron. You look odd. What Harry feared most was that he might not be able to find the mirror room again. 
With Ron covered in the cloak, too, they had to walk much more slowly than the night next night. They tried retracing Harry's route from the library, wandering around the dark passages was for nearly an hour. I'm freezing, said Ron. Let's go. Let's forget it and go back. No, Harry hissed. I know it's here somewhere. They passed a ghost of a tall witch gliding in the opposite direction, but so no, saw no one else. Just as Ron started moaning that his feet were dead with cold, Harry spotted the suit of armor. I, it's here. Just here. Yes. They pushed open the door. Harry dropped the cloak and from around his shoulders and ran to the mirror. There they were. His mother and father beamed at the sight of him. See? Harry whispered. I can't see anything. Look. Look at them. There are loads of them. I can only see you. Look at her properly. Go on. Stand where I am. Harry stepped aside, but the, with Ron in front of the mirror, he could only see his, he couldn't see his family anymore. Just Ron in his paisley pajamas. Ron, though, was staring transfixed at his image. Look at me, he said. Can you see your family standing around you? No, I'm alone, but I'm different. I look older, and I'm head boy. What? I'm, I am. I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to, and I'm holding the house cup and the Quidditch cup. I'm Quidditch captain, too. Ron tore his eyes away from the, the splendid sight to look excitedly at Harry. Do you think this mirror shows the future? How can it? All my family are dead. Let me have another look. You had it to yourself all night last night. Give me a bit more. You're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. Don't push. A sudden noise outside in the corridor put an end to their discussion. They hadn't realized how loud they, loudly they were talking. Quick! Ron threw the cloak back over them as the luminous, luminous eyes of Mrs. Norris came round the door. Ron and Harry stood quite, quite still, both thinking the same thing. Did the cloak work on cats? After what seemed an age, she turned and left. This isn't safe. She might have gone for Filch. I bet she heard us. Come on. And Ron pulled Harry out of the room. The snow still hadn't melted the next morning. Want to play chess, Harry? Said Ron. No. Why don't we go down and visit Hagrid? No, you go. I know you're still thinking about... Uh, I know what you're still think, thinking about, Harry. The, that mirror. Don't go back tonight. Why not? I don't know. I've just got a bad feeling about it. And anyway, you've got had too many close shaves already. Filch, Snape, and Mrs. Norris are wandering around. So what if they can't see you? What if they walk into you? What if you knock something over? You sound like Hermione. I'm serious, Harry. Don't go. But Harry only had one thought in his head, which was to get back in front of the mirror. And Ron wasn't going to stop him. That third night, he found his way more quickly than before. He was walking so fast, he knew he was making more noise than he was wise. But he didn't meet anyone. And there were, and there were his mother and father smiling at him again. And one of his grandfathers nodding happily. Harry sank down to sit on the floor in front of the mirror. There was nothing to stop him from staying here all night with his family. Nothing at all, except... So back again, Harry. Harry felt as though he is, his inside had turned to ice. He looked behind him. Sitting on one of the desks by the wall was none other than Albus Dumbledore. Harry must have walked straight past him, so desperate to get to the mirror, he hadn't noticed him. I... I didn't see you, sir. Strange how nearsightedness being how nearsighted being invisible can make you said dumbledore and harry was relieved to see that he was smiling so said dumbledore slipping off the desk to sit on the floor with harry you like hundreds before have discovered the delights of the mirror of Era, said i don't i didn't know it was called that sir but i expect you've realized now what it does it well it shows me my family and sh it shows your ron himself as head boy how did you know I don't need a cloak to become invisible, said Dumbledore, gently. Now, can you think what the mirror of Air said shows us all? Harry shook his head. Let me explain. The happiest man on earth would be able to see, uh, uh, to use the mirror of Erised like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into the mirror and see himself exactly as he is. Does that help? Harry thought. Then he said slowly, it shows us what we want, whatever we want. Yes and no, said Dumbledore quietly. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desires of our hearts. You, who have never known your family, see them standing around you. Ronald Weasley, who has never been, who has always been overshadowed by his brothers, sees himself standing alone, the best of them all. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. Men have wasted bef away before, entranced by what it, they have seen, or been driven back mad, not knowing if 
what it shows is real or even possible. Um, can you, you guys should comment what, um, if you feel comfortable enough, what you would probably see in the, the mirror. Um, I'm not sure. I probably see a lot of books, personally. So you probably see your family too, though, because it's Zoe. <laughs> okay, um, the mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow. Harry and I ask you not to go, Harry, with a bit there. The mayor will be moved to a new home tomorrow. Harry, and I ask you not to go looking for it again. If you ever do run across it again, you will now be prepared. It, it does not dwell on, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Remember that. Now, why don't you put that admirable Coke back on and get off the bed? Harry stood up. Sir, Professor Dumbledore, can I ask you something? Obviously, you've just done so. Dumbledore smiled. You may ask me one more thing, however. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I? I myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Harry stared. One can never have enough socks, and Dumbledore, said Dumbledore. Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't even get a single pair. Of People will insist on giving me books. Also, also, <sighs> He actually says he sees Grindelwald. Just letting you guys know, he lies and and but he saw Grindelwald because he's gay. So, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, it was only when he was back in the in bed that it struck Harry that Dumbledore might not have been quite truthful. But then he thought, as he shoved Scabbers off his pillow, it was been quite a personal question. Okay, I'm gonna go drink some water for a sec. <clears throat> I need to, because I'm starting a new chapter. <laughs> um, chapter 13, Nicholas Flamel. Dumbledore had convinced Harry not to go looking for the Mirror of Erised again, and for the rest of the Christmas holidays, the invisibility cloak stayed folded at the bottom of his trunk. Harry wished he could forget what he had seen in the mirror as easily, but he couldn't. He started having nightmares over and over again. He dreamt about his parents disappearing in a flash of green light, while a high voice cackled with laughter. Hold up, I need to find tissues. Oh, the nose. I don't like it. <sighs> Okay. Um, you see, Dumbledore was right. The mirror could drive you mad, said Ron, when Harry told him about those dreams. Hermione, who had came back the day before term started, took a different view of things. She was torn between horror at the idea of Harry being out of bed, roaming the school three nights in a row, if Filch had caught you, and disappointment that he hadn't found, had, hadn't at least found out who Nicholas Flamel was. They had almost given up hope of ever finding Flamel in a little, in a library book, even though Harry was still sure he read the name somewhere. Once term had started, there were back to skimming through books for 10 minutes during their breaks. Harry had even less time than the other two because Quidditch practices had started up again. Wood was working the team harder than ever. Even the endless rain that had replaced the snow couldn't dampen his spirits. The Weasleys complained that Wood was becoming a fanatic, but Harry was on Wood's side. If they won their match, their next match against Hufflepuff, they would overtake Slytherin in the house championship for the first time in seven years. Quite apart from wanting to win, Harry found that he had fewer nightmares when he was tired out after training. Then during out during one particular wet and muddy practice session, Wood gave the team a bit of bad news. He got he just gotten very angry with the Weasleys, who had kept dive bombing each other and pretending to fall off their brooms. Will you stop messing around? he yelled. That's exactly the sort of thing that'll lose us the match. Snape's refereeing this time, and he'll be looking for any excuse to knock off points of Gryffindor. 
George Weasley really did fall off his broom at those words. Snape's refereeing? He spluttered through a mouthful of mud. What's he... He ever refereed a once he ever refereed a Quidditch match. He's not going to be fair if we over might overtake Slytherin. The rest of the team landed next to George to complain too. It's not my fault, said Wood. We've just got to make sure we play a clean game, so Snape hasn't got any excuse to pick on us. Which was all very well, though thought Harry. But he had another reason for not wanting Snape near him while he, he was playing Quidditch. The rest of the team hung back to talk to one another, as usual, at the end of practice, but Harry headed straight back to the Gryffindor common room, where he had found Ron and Hermione playing chess. Chess was the only thing Hermione ev ever lost at, something Harry and Ron thought was very good for her. Don't talk to me for a moment, said Ron when Harry sat down next to him. I need to constant- He caught sight of Harry's face. What's the matter with you? You look terrible. Speaking quietly so that no one else would hear, Harry told the other two about Snape's sudden, sinister desire to be a Quidditch referee. Don't play, Herm said Hermione at once. Say you're ill, said Ron. Pretend to break your leg, Hermione suggested. Really break your leg, said Ron. I can't. Great friends, said Harry. There isn't a reserve seeker. If I back out, Gryffindor can't play at all. At that moment, Neville toppled into the common room. How he had managed to climb through the portrait hole was anybody's guess, because his legs had been stuck together with what they recognized at once as the leg locker curse. He must have been at a bunny hop all the way to the Gryffindor Tower. Everyone fell over laughing except Hermione, who leaped up to and performed the counter curse. Neville's leg sprang open, and he got to his feet, trembling. What happened? Hermione asked leading him over to sit with Harry and Ron. Malfoy, said Neville shakily. I met him outside the library. He said he was looking for someone to practice that on. Go to Professor McGonagall, Hermione urged Neville. Report him. Neville shook his head. I don't want a more trouble, he mumbled. You've got to stand up to him, Neville, said Ron. He used to, He's used to walking all over people, but there's no reason to lie down in front of him and make it easier. There's no need to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that, Neville choked out. Harry felt in his pocket of his robe and pulled out a chocolate frog, the very last one from the box Hermione had given him for Christmas. He gave it to Neville, who looked as though he might cry. You were of twelve of Malfoy, Harry said. The Sorting Hat chose you for Gryffindor, didn't he? And where's Malfoy and sticking Slytherin? Neville's lips twitched in a weak smile as he unwrapped the frog. Thanks, Harry. I will think I'll go to bed. Do you want the card as you collect them? You collect them, don't you? As Neville walked away, Harry looked at the famous wizard card, Dumbledore, again. He said, he was the first son I ever... He gasped. He stared at the back of the card. Then he looked at, up at Ron and Hermione. I found him, he whispered. I found Flamel. I told you I read his name somewhere. I read it on the train coming here. Listen to this. Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945 for the discovery of 12 uses of dragon blood and his work on alchemy with his partner... Nicholas Flamel. Hermione jumped to her feet. He hadn't looked so ex she hadn't looked so excited since they'd gotten back to the marks for their very first place of piece of homework. Stay there, she said, and she sprinted up the stairs to the girls' dormitory. Harry and Ron barely had time to exchange mystified looks before before she had was dashing back, an enormous old book in her arms. I never thought to look in here, she was very excitedly. I got this out of the library weeks ago for a bit of light reading. Light? said Ron, but Hermione told them to be quiet until she'd looked something up and started flicking through frantically the pages, muttering to herself. At last, she found what she was looking for. I knew it! I knew it! Are we allowed to speak yet? said Ron grumpily. Hermione ignored him. Nicholas Flamel, she whispered dramatically, is the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. This didn't have quite the effect she'd expected. The what? said Harry and Ron. Oh, honestly, don't you two read? Look, read that there. She pushed the book toward them, and Harry and Ron read... The ancient study of alchemy is concerned with making the sorcerer's stone a legendary substance with astonishing powers. The stone will transfer e transform any metal into pure gold. It also produces the elixir of life, which will make the drinker immortal. 
There have been many reports of the Sorcerer's Stone over the centuries, but the only stone currently in existence belongs to Mr. Nicholas Flamel, the noted alchemist and opera lover. Mr. Flamel, who celebrated his 665th birthday last year, enjoys a quiet life in Devon with his wife, Purnell, 658. See, said Hermione, when Harry and Ron had finished, the doc... The dog must be guarding Flamel's sorcerer's stone. I bet he was asked Dumbledore to keep it safe for him because they were friends and he knew something was after it. That's why he wanted the stone moved out of Gringotts. A stone that makes gold and stops from you from ever dying? Said Harry, no wonder Snape's after it. Anyone would want it. And no wonder we can't find Flamel in the study of recent developments in wizardry, said Ron. He's not exactly recent if he's 665, is he? The next morning, in defense against the dark arts, while copying down several ways of treating werewolf fights, Harry and Ron were still discussing what they'd do with a sorcerer's stone if they had one. It wasn't until Ron said he'd buy his own Quidditch team that Harry remembered about Snape and the coming match. I'm going to play, he told Ron and Hermione. If I don't, all the Sutherlands will think I'm just too scared to face Snape. I'll show them. I'll really wipe the smiles off their face if we win. Just as long as we're not wiping you off the field, Sir Hermione. <sighs> as the match drew nearer, however, Harry became more and more nervous. Whatever he told Ron and Hermione, the rest of the team weren't too calm either. The t idea of overtaking Slytherin in the house championship was wonderful. No one had done it for seven years. But would they be allowed to with such a biased referee? Harry didn't know whether he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to be running into Snape wherever he went. At times, he even wondered whether Snape was following him, trying to catch him on his own. Potions lessons were turning into a sort of weekly torture. Snape was so horrible to Harry. He could, could Snape possibly know that he'd found out with a sorcerer's stone? Harry didn't see how he could know, yet he sometimes had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. Legilimens. Snape's legit, 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 I can't say it apparently. But yeah, that's why. Harry knew when they wished him good luck outside the locker rooms the next afternoon that Ron and Hermione were wondering whether, whether they'd ever see him alive again. This wasn't what you'd call comforting. Harry hardly heard the, a word of Wood's pep talk as he pulled his Quidditch robes on and picked up his Nimbus 2000. Ron and Hermione, meanwhile, had found a place in the stands next to Neville, who couldn't understand why they looked so grim and worried, or why they had both brought their wands to the match. Little did Harry know that Ron and Hermione had been secretly practicing the leg locker curse. They had gotten the idea from Malfoy using it on Neville, and were ready to use it on Snape if he showed any signs of wanting to hurt Harry. Now don't forget, it's, it's locomoto mortis, Hermione muttered, as Ron slipped his wand into his sleeve. I know, Ron snapped. Don't nag. Back in the locker room, Wood had taken Harry aside. Don't want to pressure you, Potter, but if we ever need a, an early capture it's of the snitch, it's now. Finish the game before Snape can f favor Hufflepuff too much. The whole school's out there, said Fred Weasley, peering out the door. Even blimey, Dumbledore's come to watch. Harry's heart did a somersault. Dumbledore, he said, dashing to the door to make sure. Fred was right. There was mis not mistaking the silver beard. Harry could have laughed out loud with relief. He was safe. There was simply no way that Snape would dare try to hurt him if Dumbledore was watching. Perhaps that was why Snape was looking so angry at the team as the teams marched over the field, something that Ron noticed too. I've never seen Snape look so mean, he told Hermione. Look off. They're off. Look, they're off. Ouch. Someone had poked Ron in the back of the head. It was Malfoy. Oh, sorry, Weasley. Didn't see you there. Malfoy grinned broadly at Crab and Goyle. Wonder how long Potter's gonna going, going to stay on his broom this time. Anyone want to bet? What about you, Weasley? Ron didn't answer. Snape just had awarded Hufflepuff a penalty because George had hit a bludger at him. Hermione, who had all his fingers, her fingers crossed in her lap, was squinting physically at Harry who was circling the game like a hawk, looking for the snitch. 
You know how I think they chose people for the Gryffindor team, said Malfoy loudly a few minutes later, as Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason at all. It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who's got no br money. Uh, you should be on the team, Longbottom. You've got no brains. Neville went bright red, but turned into a seat to face Meville. I'm worth twelve of you, Malfoy, he stammered. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle howled with laughter, but Ron, still not during... Daring to take his eyes from the game, said, You tell him, Neville. Longbottom, if brains were gold, you'd be poorer than Weasley. And that's saying something. Ron's nerves were already stretched to the breaking point with the anxiety about Harry. I'm warning you, Malfoy. One more word. Ron, said Hermione suddenly. Harry, what, where? Harry had suddenly gone into a spectacular dive, which drew gas and cheers from the crowd. Hermione stood up, her crossed fingers in her mouth, as Harry streaked toward the ground like a bullet. You're in luck, Weasley. Potter spotted, uh, obviously spotted some money on the ground, said Malfoy. Ron snapped before Malfoy knew what was happening. Ron was on top of him, wrestling him to the ground. Neville hesitated, then clambered over the back of the seat to help. Come on, Harry, Hermione screamed, leaping onto her seat to watch as Harry sped straight at Snape. He didn't, she didn't even notice. Notice Malfoy and Ron rolling around under the, her seats over the scuffles and yelps coming from the whirl of fists that was Neville, Crab, and Goyle. Or, or, the scuffles. Up in the air, Snape turned on his broomstick just in time to see something scarlet shoot past him, missing him by inches. The next second, Harry had pulled out of his dive, his arm raised in triumph. The snip so the snitch clasped in his hand. The sand erupted. It had been a record. No one had, could ever re remember the snitch being caught so quickly. Ron, Ron, where are you? The game's over. Harry's won. We've won. Gryffindor's in the lead, shrieked Hermione, dancing up and down on her seat and hucking Pravardi Patil in the row in front. Harry jumped off his broom a foot from the ground. He couldn't believe it. He'd done it. The game was over. He had barely lasted five minutes as Gryffindor came spilling onto the field. He saw Snape land nearby, white face and tight-lipped. Then Harry felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up into Dumbledore's smiling face. Well done, said Dumbledore quietly, so that only Harry could hear. Nice to see you haven't been brooding about that mirror. Been keeping busy. Excellent. Snape spat bitterly on the ground. Harry left the locker room alone some time later to take his Nimbus 2000 back to the broom shed. He couldn't ever remember feeling happier. He'd really done something to be proud of. Now, now, no one could say he was the famous Harry Potter, just a famous name anymore. The evening air had smelled, has never smelled so sweet. He walked over the damp grass, relieving the last hour in his head, which was a happy blur. Gryffindors running up to lift him onto their shoulders, Ron and Hermione in the distance, jumping up and down, Ron cheering through a heavy nosebleed. Harry had reached the shed. He leaned against the wooden door and looked up at Hogwarts, with his windows glowing red in the setting sun. Gryffindor in the lead. He'd done it. He's sh shown Snape. And speaking of Snape... A hooded figure came swiftly down the front steps of the castle, clearly not wanting to be seen. It walked as fast as possible toward the Forbidden Forest. Harry's victory faded from his mind as he wanted... As he watched, he recognized the figure's prowling walk, Snape, sneaking into the forest while everyone else was at dinner. What was going on? Harry jumped back onto his Nimbus 2000 and took off, gliding silently over the castle. He saw Snape enter the forest at a run. He followed. The trees were so thick he couldn't see where Snape was, had going. He flew in circles lower and lower, brushing the tops of the branches and trees until he heard voices. He glided toward them and landed noiselessly. They're so loud. It's so loud. Um, he glided toward them and landed noiselessly in a towering beech tree. He clambered carefully along one of the branches, holding tight to his broomstick, trying to see through the leaves. Below in a shadowy clearing stood Snape, but he wasn't alone. Quirrell was there, too. Harry couldn't make out the look on his face, but he was stuttering worse than ever. Harry strained to catch what he was saying. Dad, Mom, can you, can you try being a little bit more quiet? It's hard to concentrate up here. Yeah, I'm asking to be a little bit quiet. I'm asking to be quiet. I'm asking to be a little quieter. 
Um, d d don't don't know why, why you want, wanted to, to meet here all of the pla places, Severus. Oh, I thought we'd keep this part private, said Snape, his voice icy. Students are supp aren't supposed to know about the Sorcerer's Stone, after all. Harry leaned forward. Corrales was mumbling something. Snape interrupted him. Have you found out how to get past the Beast of Hagrid's yet? B -b -b Severus, I... You don't want me as your enemy, Corral, said Snape, taking a step toward him. I, I, I don't know what you... You know perfectly well what know what I mean. An owl hooted loudly, and Harry ne nearly fell out of the tree. He steadied himself in time to hear say, You, your little bit of hocus pocus. I'm waiting, but but I d d d don't. Very well, Snape cut in. We'll have another little chat soon when you've had time to think things over and decide where your loyalties lie. He threw his cloak over his head and shirt off out of the clearing. It was almost dark now, but Harry could see Corral standing quite as still as though he was petrified. Harry, where have you been? Hermione squeaked. We won, you, we won, you won, we won, shouted Ron, thumping Harry on the back. And I gave Malfoy a black eye, and Neville tried to take on Crabbe and Goyle single-handedly. He's still out cold, but Madame Pomfrey says he'll be all right. Talk about showing Slytherin. Everyone's waiting for you in the common room. We've had a, we've had, we're having a party. Fred and George stole some cakes and stuff from the kitchens. Stole. Because literally... This, like, I think it's like the fifth book. They learn how easy it is to take food from the kitchen. Literally, the house elves are like, Here, take like billions of stuff from the kitchen, please. Um, never mind that now, said Harry breathlessly. Let me let's find an empty room. You wait till you hear this. He made sure Pease wasn't inside before shutting the door behind them. Then he told them what he'd seen and heard. So, you, we were right. It is the Sorcerer's Stone, and Snape's trying to steal it force Quirrell to help him get it. He asked if he knew how to get past Fluffy, and he said something about Quirrell's Hocus Pocus. I reckon there are other, are other things guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Most of the chances, probably. And Quirrell would have done some anti-dark arts spell that Snape needs to break through. So, you mean the stone's only safe as long as Quirrell stands up to Snape, said Hermione in alarm. It'll be gone by next Tuesday, said Ron. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a drink of water again. Ooh. My nose itches, and I don't like it. <sighs> okay, um, hold up, I need to check something really quickly. Okay. Um, how are you guys today? I'm doing all right. By um, he just wants to act like he cares. Yeah. Right, right. We literally just had like the mob running the White House. We probably do have a more similar. Uh, uh, oh no. That's, that's part of it. We know that's always been part of it. Because that was Trump's. That's how his dad made all his money. Is on food Russian processing. A, a uh, Zoe's um, friend is sick with the flu. So, oof. <laughs> I feel bad for that. <coughs> um, okay. How many chapters? How many pages left to over? Okay, it's a chunk. How long is this chapter? Okay. Okay. Chapter 14. Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback. Corral, however, must have been braver than they thought. In the weeks that followed, he didn't seem to be getting paler and thinner. He he did seem to be getting paler and thinner, but it didn't look like as though he'd cracked yet. Every time they passed the third floor corridor, Harry and Ron and Hermione would press their ears to the door to check that Fluffy was still growling inside. Snape was sweeping about in his usual bad temper, which surely meant the stone was still safe. 
Whatever Harry Pascrell these days, he gave him an enormous, encouraging smile, sort of smile. And Ron has started telling people off for laughing at Quirrell's study, Strutter. Hermione, however, had more on her mind than the Sorcerer's Stone. She had started drawing up study schedules and color-coding all her notes. Harry and Ron wouldn't have minded, but she kept nagging them to do the same. Hermione, the exams are ages away. Ten weeks, Hermione snapped. That's not ages. That's like a second to Nicholas Fumel. But... We're not 600 years old, Ron reminded her. Anyway, what are you studying for? You already know it all. What am I studying for? Are you crazy? You realize we need to pass these exams to get into the second year. They're very important. I should have study, been studying a month ago. I don't know what's gotten into me. Unfortunately, the teachers seemed to be thinking along the same lines as Hermione. They piled as so much homework on them that the Easter holidays weren't nearly as much fun as the Christmas ones. It was hard to relax next to Hermione, who was reciting the 12 uses of dragon's blood or practicing wand movements. Moaning and yawning, Harry and Ron spent most of their free time in the library with her, trying to get through all their exam work. I'll never remember this. Ron burst out one afternoon, throwing down his quill, looking loving longingly out of the library window. He was the first really fine day they had in months. The sky was clear, forget-me-not blue, and there was a feeling in the air of summer coming. Harry, who was looking at up Dittany in 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, didn't look up until he heard Ron say, Hagrid, what are you doing in the library? Yeah, and then you insulted her military thing after we were supposed to. Like, you took her in the back gallery and insulted her and expected her. Oh, sorry, um, the friend who has a flu is texting. I feel very bad. Why are we private messages? You know what I mean? I'm not even there. And we were at the library. I just said I didn't want to. I know we were at the library. Yeah. And I was like, I said. But that's not true. When he says something that's not true, he makes it look bad. Okay. Uh, um. And then, you know, like, your military knowledge isn't any good. Um. Harry shuffled into view, hiding something behind his back. He looked very out of place in his moleskin overcoat. Moleskin overcoat. Just looking, he said in a shifty voice. They got their that got their interest at once. And what are you lot up to? He looks suddenly suspicious. You're still not looking for Nicholas Fumel, are you? Oh, we found out a who he is ages ago," said Ron imp impressively. "And we know what the dog's guarding. It's a source of stuff." Shh! Hagrid looked around quickly to see if anyone was listening. Don't go shouting about it. What's the matter with you? There are a few things we wanted to ask you, as a matter of fact, said Hagrid. What's but about what's guarding the stone apart from Fluffy? Shh, said Hagrid again. Listen, come and see me later, and I I'm not promising I'll tell you anything, mind. But don't go rabbiting around about it about in here. Students aren't supposed to know. They'll think I've told you. See you later, then, said Harry. Hagrid shuffled off. What was he holding back behind his back, said Hermione thoughtfully. Do you think he has anything to do with Snape? I'm going to see what the section he was in, said Ron, who had enough of working. He came back a minute later with a pile of books in his arms and slammed them down on the table. Dragons, he whispered. Hagrid was looking up stuff about dragons. Look at these. Dragon species of Great Britain and Ireland, from Egg to Inferno, a dragon keeper's guide. Hagrid's always wanted a dragon. He told me so the first time we ever met him, said Hagrid. But it's against our laws, said Ron. Dragon breeding was outlawed by the Warlocks Convention of 1709. Everyone knows that. It's hard to stop muckles from noticing if we're keeping dragons in the back garden. Anyway, you can't tame dragons. It's dangerous. You should see the burns Charlie's got off wild ones in Romania. But those aren't wild dragons. But are there aren't wild dragons in Britain, said Harry. Of course there are, said Ron. Common Welsh green and Hibernian blacks. The Ministry of Magic had a, has a job hushing them up, I can tell you. Our kind have to keep putting spells on muggles who spotted them to make them forget. 
So, what on earth is Hagrid up to? Said Hermione. It's probably harder now that we have video cameras. It's like, dragon! <laughs> uh, I know, is, I don't like it. Okay. Um. It's dangerous. Curse the hour. The mystery of magic. So what on earth is Hagrid up to? Said Hermione. When they knocked on the door of the gamekeeper's hut, an hour later, they were surprised to see that all the curtains were closed. Hagrid called, who is it, before he let them in, and then shut the door quickly behind them. It was stifling hot inside, even though it was such a warm day. There was a blazing fire in the grate. Hagrid made them tea and offered them stout sandwiches, which they refused. So, you wanted to ask me something. Yes, said Hagrid. There was no point beating around the bush. We were h wondering if you could tell us what's guarding the st source of stone apart from Fluffy. Hagrid frowned at him. Oh, of course I can't, he said. Number one, I don't know myself. Number two, you know too much already, so I wouldn't tell you if I could. That stone's here for a good reason. It was almost stolen out of Gringotts. I suppose you've already worked that out and all. Beats me how you even knew about Fluffy. Oh, come on, Hagrid. You might have not want to tell us, but you do know. You know everything that goes around on here, said Hermione in a warm, flattering voice. Hagrid's beard twitched, and they could say, tell he was smiling. We only wondered who was, who had done the guarding, really, Hermione went on. We wondered who Dumbledore had trusted enough to t help him apart from you. Hagrid's chest swelled at the la these last words. Harry and Ron beamed at Hermione. Well, I don't suppose... It could hurt to tell you that. Let's see. He borrowed Fluffy from me. Then some of the teachers did enchantments. Professor Sprout, Professor Flitwick, Professor McGonagall. He ticked them off his fingers. Professor Quirrell and Dumbledore himself did something, of course. Hang on. Hang on, I've forgotten someone. Oh, yeah, Professor Snape. Snape? Yeah, you're not still on about that, are, are you? Look, Snape's helped protect the stone. He's not about to steal it. Harry knew Ron and Hermione were thinking the same thing he, as he was. If Snape had been in the on and protecting the stone, it must have been easy to find out how the other teachers had guarded it. He probably knew everything, except it seemed Quirrell's spell and how to get past Fluffy. You're the only one who knows how to get past Fluffy, aren't you, Hagrid? Said Harry anxiously. And you wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Not even the t one of the teachers. Not a soul knows except me and Dumbledore, said Hagrid proudly. Well, that's something. Harry muttered to the others, Hagrid, can you open a, a window? I'm boiling. Can't, Harry. Sorry, said Hagrid. Harry noticed him glance at the fire. Harry looked at him, too. Hagrid, what's that? But he already knew what it was. It was a very heart of the fire. Underneath the, the kettle was a huge black egg. Ah, uh, said Hagrid, fiddling nervously with his beard. That's her. Where did you get it, Hagrid? Said Ron, crouching over the fire to get a closer look at the egg. It must have cost you a fortune. Won it, said Hagrid, last night. I was down in the vill village having a few drinks and got into a game of cards with a stranger. Think he was quite glad to get rid of it, to be honest. But what are you going to do with it when it's hatched, said Hermione. Well, I've been doing some reading, said Hagrid, pulling a large book from the, under the pillow. Got this out of the library. Dragon breeding for pleasure and profit. It's a bit out of date, of course, but it's all in there. Keep the egg in the fire because their mothers breathe on them. See? And when it hatches, feed it a buckle of brandy mixed with chicken's blood every half an hour. And see here, how to recognize different eggs. What I got there is a Norwegian Ridgeback. They're, they're rare, then. He looks very pleased with himself, but Hermione didn't. Hagrid, you live in a wooden house, she said. But Hagrid wasn't listening. He was humming merrily as he stoked the fire.
Mm, my nose is really dang itchy, and I don't like it. <sighs> okay. All right. Uh, if my nose could stop itching, that would be very helpful. Okay. So now they had something else to worry about. What might help happen to Hagrid if anyone found out that he was hiding an illegal dragon in his hut? Wonder what it's like to have a peaceful life, Ron sighed. An evening after evening, they struggled through all the extra homework they were getting. Hermione now started making study schedules for her Harry and Ron, too. It was driving them nuts. That Then one breakfast time, Hedwig brought Harry another note from Hagrid. It had written only two words. It's hatching. Ron wanted to skip herbology to go straight down to the hut. Hermione wouldn't hear of it. Hermione, how many times in our lives are we going to see a dragon hatching? We've got lessons. We got, we'll, get, we'll get in trouble. And that's nothing to what Hagrid's going to be in when someone finds out what he's doing. Shut up, Hermione, Harry whispered. Malfoy was only a few feet away, and he had stopped dead to listen in. How much had he heard? He didn't like the look on Malfoy's face at all. Ron and Hermione argued all the way to Herbology, and in the end, Hermione agreed to run down to Hagrid with the other two dur during morning break. When the bell sounded from the castle at the end of their lesson, the three of them dropped their trowels at once and hurried through the grounds to the edge of the forest. Hagrid greeted them, looking flushed and excited. It's nearly out, he ushered them inside. The egg was lying on the table. There were deep cracks in it. Something was moving inside. A funny clicking noise was coming from it. They all drew their chairs up at the table and watched with bated breath. All at once, there was a scraping noise, and the egg split open. The baby dragon flopped onto the table. It wasn't exactly pretty, Harry thought. It looked like a crumpled black umbrella. Its spiny wings were huge compared to its skinny jet body. It had a long snout with wide nostrils and a stub of horns and bulging orange eyes. It sneezed. A couple of sparks flew out of its no snout. Isn't it beautiful? Hagrid muttered. He reached out a hand to stroke the dragon's head. It stamped his fingers, showing pointed fangs. Bless him, he knows his mommy, said Hag. What's the matter? Someone was looking through the gap in the curtains. It's a kid. He's running back up to school. Harry bolted to look uh, to the door and looked out. Even at a distance, there was no mistaking him. Malfoy has seen the dragon. Something about the smile lurking on Malfoy's face during the next week made Harry and Ron Hermione very nervous. They spent most of their free time in Hagrid's darkened hut trying to reason with him. Just get, let him go, said Harry, urged. See, let, set, him, set him free. I can't, said Hagrid. He's too little. He'd die. They looked at the dragon. It had grown three times in length in just one week. Smoke kept furling out of the nostrils. Harry hadn't been doing... Hagrid hadn't been doing his game keeping duties because the dragon was keeping him so busy. There were empty brandy bottles and chicken feathers all over the floor. I've decided to call him Norbert, said Hagrid, looking at the dragon with missy eyes he really knows me now watch norbert norbert where's mommy he's got, lost his marbles ron muttered his uh, harry's ear hagrid said harry loudly give it two weeks with, and norbert's going to be as long as your house malfoy could go get dumbledore at any moment hagrid bit his lip i i know i can't keep him forever but can't just dump him i can't harry suddenly turned around charlie he said you're losing it too said Ron. I'm Ron, remember? No, Charlie, your brother. Charlie in Romania, studying dragons. We could send him, Norbert, to him. Charlie can take care of him and then put him back in the wild. Brilliant, said Ron. How about it, Hagrid? And in the end, Hagrid agreed that they could send an owl to Charlie to ask him. <laughs> Sorry, I'm checking how long this chapter is. Okay. <coughs> The following week dragged by. Was Wednesday night found Hermione and Harry sitting down at the common room long after everyone else had gone to bed. The clock on the wall had just chimed midnight when the portrait hole burst open. Ron hurried out of nowhere as he pulled off Harry's invisibly cloak. He had been down at Hagrid's hut helping him feed Norbert, who was now eating dead rats by the crate. It bit me! 
he said, showing his them the hand, which was wrapped in a bloody handkerchief. I'm not going to be able to hold a quill for a week, I tell you. The dragon's the most horrible animal I've ever met. The way Hagrid goes on about it, you'd think it was a fluffy little bunny rabbit. When it bit me, he told me off for frightening it, and then I left him. He was singing a lullaby. There was a tap on the dark window. It's Hedwig, said Harry, hurling, hurrying to let her in. She's, she'll have Charlie's answer. The three of them put their heads together to read the note. Dear Ron, how are you? Thanks for the letter. I'm glad. I'd be glad to take the Norwegian witch back. It won't be easy getting him here. I think the best thing will be to send him over with some of my friends of mine who are coming to visit me next week. Trouble is, you mustn't be seen carrying an illegal dragon. Can you get the witch back up to the tallest tower at the midnight on Saturday? They can meet you there and take him away. It's still dark. Send me the answer as soon as possible. Love, Charlie. They looked at one another. We've got the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It shouldn't be too difficult. I think the cloak's big enough to cover two of us and Norbert. <coughs> it was a mark of how bad the last week had been that the other two agreed with him. Anything to get rid of Norbert and Malfoy. There was a hitch. By the next morning, Ron's bitten hand had swollen twice the usual size. He didn't know whether it was safe to go to Madame Pomfrey, would she recognize the dragon's bite? But by afternoon, though, he had no choice. The cat had turned a nasty shade of green. It looked as if Norbert's fangs were poisonous. Harry and Ron rushed him to the hospital wing at the end of the day, and Ron was in a terrible state in bed. It's not just my hand, he whispered, although that feels like it's all about to fall off. Malfoy told Madame Pomfrey he wanted to borrow one of my books so he could come and have a good laugh at me. He kept threatening to tell her what really bit me. I've told her it was a dog, but she didn't think she didn't. I don't think she believed me. I, don't, I shouldn't have hit him at the Quidditch match. That's why he's doing this. Harry and Ron. Harry and Hermione tried to calm Ron down. It will be all over on midnight on Saturday, said Hermione, but this did, didn't soothe Ron at all. On the contrary, he sat bowled up right and broke into a sweat. Midnight on Saturday, he said a horse. Oh no, oh no, I just remembered. Charlie's letter was in that book. Malfoy took. He's going to know we are going to get rid of Norbert. Harry and Ron didn't get a chance to answer. Madame Pomfrey came over at the, uh, that moment and made them go leave, saying Ron needed sleep. Hold up. I'm going to stop at... No, actually, I'm so close. I just need to push through. I can do it. Um... Let's see. It's too late to change the plan now, Harry told Hermione. We haven't got the time to send Charlie another out, and this could be our only chance to get rid of Norbert. We'll have to risk it, and we have to get the invisibility cloak. We have got the invisibility cloak. Malfoy doesn't know about that. They found Fang at the, the boarhound sitting outside with the bang, ba bandaged tail. When they went to tell Hagrid, who opened a window to let, talk to them, I won't let you in, he puffed. Norbert's in a, at a tricky stage. Nothing I can't handle. When they told him about Charlie's letter, his eyes filled with tears, although that might have been because Norbert had just bitten him on the leg. Arg! It's all right. He got. He only got my boot. He's just playing. He's just a baby, after all. The baby banged its tail on the wall, making the windows rattle. Harry and Hermione walked out back to the castle, feeling Saturday couldn't come quickly enough. They would have felt sorry for Hagrid when the time came for him to say goodbye to Norbert if they hadn't been so worried about what they would do. If It was a very dark, cloudy night, and they were a bit late arriving at Hagrid's hut because they had to wait for Peeves to get out of the way in the entrance hall, where he'd been playing tennis against the wall. Hagrid had Norbert packed and ready in a large crate. He's got lots of rats and plenty of brandy for the journey, he said, gr gr Hagrid in a muffled voice, and I've packed his teddy bear in case he gets lonely. From inside the crate came a ripping noise that sounded to Harry as though the teddy was having his head torn off. Bye-bye, Norbert, Hagrid sobbed as H Harry and Hermione covered the crate with invisibly cloak and stepped underneath it themselves. Mommy will never forget you. How they managed to get the crate back up to the castle, they never knew. Midnight took nearer as they heaved Norbert up this marble staircase in the entrance hall and along the dark corridors, up another staircase, then another. 
Even one of Harry's shortcuts didn't make the work much easier. Nearly there, Harry panted as they reached the corridor beneath the tallest tower. Then a sudden movement ahead of them made them almost drop the crate, forgetting that they were already invisible. They shrank into the shadows, staring at the dark outlines of two people gripping with each other, gra uh, grappling with each other at ten feet away. A lamp flared. Professor McGonagall, in a tartan bathrobe and a hairnet, had Malfoy by the ear. Detention, she shouted, and twenty points from Slytherin, wandering around the midnight, uh, middle of the night. How dare you? You don't understand, Professor. Harry Potter's coming. He's got a dragon. What other rubbish? How dare you tell such lies? Come on. I I shall see Professor Snape about you, Malfoy. The steep spiral staircase up the top of this tower seemed the easiest thing to world after that. Not until they stepped onto the cold night air did they throw off the cloak, glad to be able to breathe properly again. Hermione did a sort of jig. Malfoy's got detention. I could sing. Don't, Harry advised her. Chuckling about Malfoy, they waited, Norbert thrashing about in his crate. About ten minutes later, four broomsticks came swooping down out of the darkness. Charlie's friends were a cheery lot. They showed Harry and Hermione the harness they'd rigged up so that they could suspend Norbert between them. They all helped buckle Norbert safely into it, and then Harry and Ron shook hands with the others and thanked them very much. At last, Norbert was going, going, gone. They slipped back down the spiral staircase, their hearts as light as their hands. Now that Norbert was off them, no more dragon, Malfoy in detention, what could spoil their happiness? The answer to that was waiting at the foot of the stairs as a step out of the corridor. Filch's face looped him suddenly out of the darkness. Well, 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 he whispered. We are in trouble. They'd left the invisibility cloak on top of the tower. Chapter 15. The Forbidden Forest. We have three more chapters. <sighs> okay. Sorry, my nose is very itchy. It's been all itchy for like the weirdest amount of time. Bleh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, hold up. I'm distracted. So, um, can you, uh, can you guys comment what you think about, um, what we've read so far, what your comments are, stuff like that? What do you think? You know what I mean? Stuff like that. I'm so sorry about the loud noises behind. Like, I would, like, so not want to be here because I don't like loud noises. So this is really hard for me. But, um, I personally think that I need to finish this because I promised that I would read all of it. So, um... But just be aware I might be a little bit dissociated because I hate loud noises and everyone's being so loud downstairs. So. <sighs> I'm actually going to stop here because it's gonna it's really loud and I can't concentrate. I might uh, live stream later today when it's less loud and finish the chapters off. But... Thanks for watching. All of our links are down in the description down below. Thank you for listening. I love you guys. Bye.